Now I might be having some trouble with Facebook one second. I see us on my phone. Awesome. Yeah, it ended up working. Great. <laughs> um, so now I'm going to press record on this meeting. I see us. Awesome. Yeah, it ended up a little feedback there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm so happy y'all are here tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it is six. 10 about, so we'll get started a little later. Um, I, my name is Margaret Stern. I'm the Program and Communications Director for the Sioux Sitna River Coalition, and I'm here today with Doug Galtieri and Wendy Patino with the Bear Necessities Coalition. We are hopefully going to have one more member, Brian Ochnock, joining us in a little bit, but he's having some Zoom difficulties. Um, so yeah, always Zoom is always a always a fun project. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the Sioux Sitna River Coalition um, is supported in our winter speaker series event by the Jessica Stevens Foundation, the Talkeetna Community Council, and the um, Chase Community Council. Um, and over the course of the winter, we have a series of talks on unique experiences to be had in the life in the watershed and all uh, different scientists come and talk about their work. Um, but after a really interesting year last year with bears all throughout Tapkeetna, thought it was a great idea to have the Bear Necessities Coalition come and give a talk to our community about things that we can do to um, mitigate conflict with bears in our community. Um, and so with that, I will pass it over to Doug and Wendy, and they can uh, let us know what their coalition is about and how we can live um, in harmony with our bear neighbors. All right. Thank you, SRC and Margaret. We really appreciate it. And we love talking about bears and our bear neighbors. Um, so that's why we're here. How can we live better with them and in harmony with them? Um, so Bear Necessities Coalition has been around for a while. Brian Alkinek, who we hope is going to jump in anytime now, and his wife, Diane, and a cadre of, you know, really concerned Alkina citizens began this coalition grassroots back in 2001 um, after six bears were shot right in the downtown area of Del Talkeetna. Um, downtown and in some neighboring areas, but pretty close to downtown. And there were a lot of close encounters happening. In fact, there was one that got written up in the newspaper at the time, a tourist frightened right on Main Street and um, charged and, you know, it was pretty, pretty wild. So um, at that time, there were no bear resistant trash cans in town and there was growing tourism happening and garbage was attracting bears to town and keeping them roaming around town instead of just moving through, which is what we want to do. So this group of Talkina residents who had uh, extreme respect for our bears and for the magnificence of them banded together and started the Bear Necessities Coalition. And it was really in an effort to reduce these dangerous situations for people and for bears. Right. So the purpose of Bear Necessities Coalition is to educate our public um, on practices, best practices to live in harmony and also um, to eliminate human generated food sources that attract our bears and make it dangerous for them and us. Finding solutions for our garbage, for our livestock. Um, and so that we can, you know, live safely together and enjoy the benefits <laughs> of a healthy relationship. Because we know in Alaska, you know, the bear is one of our symbols. I was saying on KTNA this morning, it in fact is a sign that we live under, you know, under the Big Dipper, which is the great bear. And we have so much culture and so much history. And if you go into any 
shop or if you look through your own, you know, t-shirt collection or on your walls, you, I bet, are going to look around and find bears. So it is such a deep part of our culture and they live right outside our doors. And so Bear Necessities Coalition, you know, back in 2001 did a lot of things, education, going into schools, um, getting posters made, uh, putting out the same information that we're going to share a lot of it today. And they did get a bed tax grant to buy and purchase bear resistant trash cans for downtown that you will still see around downtown. So those are still happening. Uh, 50 gallon drums that also were created so that residents could use these as well. I have one, I think you have one, Doug, and they're still around. Um, so all of those things were done. A great book was written and music was created um, for Bear Necessities that is still around. You'll see that book in the library and it's got all this artwork of Talkeetna. Anyway, we're, um, we're kind of back into another surge of bears here in 20. 24. So last year, there were a lot of calls to fishing game. They got a lot of calls. We were seeing a lot of people concerned and bears getting into trash. Um, there was one reported shooting of a bear um, that was in defense, you know, of life or property. But we know more happened um, that weren't necessarily reported. So we're kind of back to reinvigorate our message and work together as a community to figure out how we solve this. And we've got some ideas that we know have worked in the past that we wanna share and talk about. So that's kind of some of the history um, going back and then we'll start talking about what we're doing now, but but I'll stop for a minute. And Doug, do you wanna add anything to that? Um, yeah, I think I think it's important that um, when we, when we look back over the now 20 some years from 2001's surge in bear activity to you know present day there's factors that drive that um when bears either their population their numbers their uh, habitat is is in some form of stress whether it's from fires or river levels being too high or too low or the fish are low or inaccessible um you know, numbers of bears, once a certain carrying capacity is reached, then then bears find themselves being pushed into uh, non-ideal, you know, habitat, which is people's backyards. There's another factor that we have neglected to sort of mention even today, and it's something that's not avoidable, but is the growth of subdivisions that have developed all along the Spur Road, um, large tracts of land being sold for, you know, human uh, housing and residential areas that weren't there 20 years ago. Um, all of those have cut into what was more or less contiguous forest that buffered a great deal of Talkeetna, um, where bears could come and go and, and, and make their way to the small streams and drainages and whatnot with little or no impact on people or even seeing anybody's yard. But now we know we've got these subdivisions that, you know, go right up to the ridge line that looks over the Susitna, that go out up close to the Telkeetnas, you know, so now there's just also more people in the area um, to have these these interactions with. And some folks coming from out of state or that um, just haven't had to worry about bears before. Um, and so trying to get people, um, you know, it's everyone's right to have their property and build their homes where, where they shall be. Um, but it's also a, a responsibility to, if you're going to be living a, in and around bears, which is every part of Alaska, um, you need to have just some basic tools in your toolbox to mitigate these things. And so um, I think when we talk about um, that 20 some year gap of any significant bear activity, it doesn't mean that bears weren't around. It just means that maybe for whatever reasons or that they're they're coming into contact with new developments that, um, you know, they're just, oh, this wasn't here, you know, last time I came through this part of the world, this, these houses weren't here. Bears have a, an incredible homing instinct, their, their ability to, to uh, find their way from point A to point B uh, at, a, at a specific time is, is almost unparalleled in the animal world. And uh, so when new things come in their path, well, they're going to check them out. And that's, 
um, unfortunately happened a great deal last summer. And so um, it was a good wake up call, like, oh, we, you know, this needs to be brought back up to speed a bit and maybe we need to reintroduce some things to people. So um, yeah, yeah. I have a, you know, one of those bear cans from 2001 that we have and it's that's what we use and we rely on and um it's it's a very simple it's one of the few conservation problems where truly individual act activity makes a big difference you know we have all these other concerns about things going on but this type of thing is something that's your responsibility it's it's just simple acts to make a big impact um and I, I, it's it's kind of rewarding to know there are still things out there we can we can um, make better just by people being a little better behaved. Yes, well said. Just putting our intentions together as a community to work on this is powerful. And those every everything we do, we see help and work. So those bare barrels really work. I think it was like three summers ago, I got to watch, you know, a nice big brown bear playing with my bear barrel 50 gallon drug and he, at one point he's on his back with all legs in the air and you know just kind of rolling this like a circus <laughs> trick yeah like but it's just yeah so powerful and so talented and you know he tried his best to get in it and didn't and walked off and I never saw him again and it was wonderful um so we know we can live with them in harmony and safety for both of us. So yeah. we want to talk about all those ways we can do it and have that conversation with the community. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I don't know, Wendy, I've got, I've, I've got that presentation, which might insert yeah. in here to just talk a little bit about bears, um, some of their adaptations and behaviors that are, are, um, driving them into situations where they end up in your yard or in the behind your restaurant, you know, but up in a, in a dumpster. Um, but just so folks that are listening and, 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 uh, and watching um, might just have a little more understanding about the animals themselves and how we know some of these methods are very effective at keeping them um, at bay from, from having issues with human uh, interaction. So I love um, it. Thank you for putting this together. Oh yeah, you know, no. And, as and, I've been, we've been starting to talk about bare necessities. I've been um, kind of reminded. I've had many community members come up to me and say, "Oh yeah," and and just in conversations with them about the bears, say, "You know, I don't know that much about bears, or I don't feel like I know enough about them," which surprised me. But then I realized, yeah. And we were, we're just kind of so used to, you know, them in a way. And they are so good at observing us and being quiet. And um, so they know much more about us than we do about them. So I asked Doug to put this together. Okay, yeah. Add his knowledge for all of us. Let's see how this goes. How's that looking? Looks great. Great. Okay. So yeah, as Wendy was just saying, um, oops, we're back. She had asked me to put together a little uh, information about bears. My, if you, those of you that don't know, um, my background is a uh, biologist, conservation biologist, and um, I've been working, oh, since I've moved to Alaska for the last 25 years, uh, guiding uh, folks around the state and, and other parts of the world, really. I've spent a significant amount of time uh, with people recreating out uh, in bear country from Denali National Park, Katmai National Park, Kenai Fjords National Park, um, and a lots of work in the Arctic in Canada and Greenland and, um, and up in Svalbard in Norway with polar bears, um, which is a whole different ball of wax. But um, basically, one of the take homes I always like to leave with people when we are in bear country is that they don't, they don't want anything to do with us by and large, black bears and brown bears. Um, they, if we weren't here, they would be just, just fine with that. And, and uh, brown bears in particular take great pains in, in avoiding people and human related things. Um, it's when it's sort of thrust in their face and they can't do anything about it. 
is an issue. Black bears are a slightly different story. They're a little more uh, quizzical and have a little bit more, uh, you know, curiosity and, and they make their way through life by exploring um, things even in, in more so than brown bears do. So I just want to talk a little bit about some other adaptations and their behaviors um, that, uh, how they make their way through the world um, and then how some of those are being uh, impacted by our presence and our behaviors. So in general, there, here's all the species of bears in the world. The extant species are living species. And you can see we have uh, black bears up here in the Susitna Valley and throughout uh, much of the state of Alaska. Um, and they're, um, much of what I'll talk about is sort of dual overlap. It kind of covers both, both animals and each species has slightly different behavioral quirks and, and, and biological, you know, factors that are slightly different, but, uh, and then we have grizzly bears or, or brown bears. Uh, both are the same species. Uh, grizzly bears tend to be bears, uh, up in the interior, um, the barren ground grizzly is just that. It's a bear that lives uh, typically in alpine tundra or, or subarctic tundra, um, very few trees or forests. Um, and many of our bears in Alaska have no access to salmon, which everyone associates with bears. Um, and then the bears we have here in Talkeetna, uh, I would classify as, as brown bears by the this some of the definitions, you know, if the bears have a reliable protein source such as salmon, um, then they get larger, they have better ability to grow um, much faster. They're the same species. Um, and so that kind of puts them in the brown bear category, but they also like all brown bears have a open ground um, part of their natural uh, history is spent up in the mountains uh, where they den above tree line. And they also spend a lot of time foraging on berries. So um, there's the two, the two creatures in particular, black bears, as most of us know, have a straight um, head, not a, not a, not a chiseled forehead, but a straight from the nose to the, to the top of the cranium. And brown bears have a very dished out face with a big hump. I think there's a bit of, oh, let me go to this slide here just to show that. So you can see the basic general characteristics of the animals. Uh, black bears in general are smaller uh, than brown bears, although a black bear that gets regular salmon um, in, in some places can get huge. Um, they have shorter, more hooked-like claws. Um, don't be fooled when people say, oh, if you're in grizzly bear country, just climb a tree. Um, they can't climb. That's not true. Black bears are very, very good climber, climbers, but an adult full-grown brown bear can climb up to 20 feet up a tree. Um, so there's no way you're getting up that tree faster than that bear is going to climb. Uh, black bears have that straight nose, snout to, to forehead, and gr grizzly bears have a dished out um, top of their cranium is squared off. And they also have a very large hump uh, musculature structures above their their back and their shoulders. That's a very clear identification. Color isn't great to go by with these animals because some brown bears can be uh, um, quite light or very dark and some black bears can be the same. But in general, we have both of these bears living here in this area. They utilize it differently in many ways, but in the in many ways they are the same, um, cut from the same cloth, so to speak. Uh, black bears evolved in North America before grizzly bears or brown bears made it over from Eurasia. Um, for a while, they had the run of the run of the place, um, but black bears are North American uh, evolved species, and grizzly and brown bears evolved in Eurasia and then came over the Bering Land Bridge, um, where they then met their black bear brethren. So just to go over a few um, basic things, I try to avoid slides with long lists of stuff, but um, this is just helpful to get some of the facts out there while, while I'm moving ahead. Um, both of these animals are, are omnivorous, which means they eat anything, basically anything they can find that's food worthy, uh, they will consume it. Um, in their yearly roamings, once they're out of the den and, and before the winter, when they go back into the den, um, 
bears have very specific mental maps of where and when to find food. And with that, for instance, take brown bears that have to bend above tree line. They're, the Talkeetna Mountains are a good ways away. Um, many of the rivers they're going to forage in are, are tens of miles away, at least. So in the course of leaving the den and getting to, say, the river in the midsummer when the salmon are coming in, um, those bears are foraging almost exclusively on, on herbaceous material, uh, grasses, um, uh, devil's club uh, buds when they come out, horsetail or equisetum. There's a big forage for them in the spring. They're basically trying to get by until the salmon show up for, for bears around here. And then in the fall and late summer, they feast on the berries as well. But in that process, these bears are coming into um, many different habitats. And in that time frame, they're going to look for anything that they can eat. You know, they are big animals. They do have a high caloric demand. They need to put on lots of weight before the winter. Um, in some cases, almost doubling their, their weight or more before they go into the den. So any food source that catches their nose um, is going to be something they're going to investigate. And speaking of that, their sense of smell is remarkable. And I'll and I'll I'll talk in more detail in a bit about that. But in general, um, if you think you have a good sense of smell, like some people can really smell, oh, like, ooh, wow, it smells like this, smells like that. Um, bears on average have 2,000 times better olfaction than humans do. It's a it's it's their strongest sense by by a long shot. Bears have fairly decent vision. Um, they have pretty good hearing. It's about equal to ours, um, but they have an amazing sense of smell. Their whole day is run by their nose. Um, in the course of their summer, you know, spring to fall, um, depending on the species and where they are and how their food is partitioned around their, their range, some, some bears, big male brown bears can cover hundreds of square miles in the course of one summer. Um, on average, it's probably more like 30 to 70 or something like that, but some bears roam a lot. And so just think of from where you're sitting right now, if you're in Alaska, um, go 100 square miles or 50 square miles away from your, where you are, and um, that's how much area a bear covers in the course of a summer. Um, with that, as I mentioned, their ability to roam and, and look for food and know when and where to find it in particular, um, these guys remember that anytime they find food somewhere, it's it's in the database. So if your backyard happens to be one of those, you can guarantee that bear will be back. And um, that's one of the things that drives them into conflict with us. And um, overall, as it says here, they're creatures of habit. Um, it's necessity for them. Evolution has uh, shaped these animals to exploit um, and consume everything they can find in the course of a summer. And so um, that mental map of where all that food is um, creates very regular patterns. For some bears exhibit just almost the exact same roaming and wanderings year after year after year because that's how I was successful last year. I'm going to be successful doing it again this year. And then lastly, I'll talk a little bit about their role in our ecosystem. They are the top, they're omnivores, but they're also carnivores. Of course, they do take moose calves and, and uh, in other places, caribou calves. Um, that's a very short window of time for them to get prey like that. Um, so eating um, and consuming plant material occupies most of their time. Um, when we talk about bears and salmon, there's a very interesting nutrient cycle that I'll, I'll touch on here at the end. But more or less, every habitat that you can see for 100 square miles, a bear is going to occupy it and utilize it. So that's really, we're in their backyards. They're not in our backyards. Like so that. mentioning the claws, one of their key features, particularly brown bears and grizzly bears, um, if you're going to be on the open country and you need to spend a lot of your time eating roots of grasses, sedges, and other herbaceous material, uh, plants, um, digging up a little swath of tundra um, is a lot easier if you're equipped with massive shoulder muscles and basically um, five excavators on your each paw. 
they can dig that pollen of the tundra, rip up the mat, and they can get to the roots underneath there, which is where all the starches and proteins and sugars are, are stored. That's where they're going to be getting their food. And you wonder how does an animal like a, a local bear around here, a big male, may go to three, 400, 450 pounds, something like that. How does an animal get that big eating all that? Well, they do it all day long. They sleep for several hours and they go right back to work looking for food. And it's those claws right there that allow them to do that, as well as the shoulder muscles that they have. And black bears, too. They're very good diggers. Um, they have a different way to utilize that component where they can dig for grubs and whatnot, tear apart uh, pretty much anything they want to get into if it's got food in there. Okay. Um, uh, the yearly cycle for bears is pretty standard for both, both species. Um, some variation in timings a little bit. Certainly habitat use is different. Um, in, in general, black bears den typically in the forest uh, below tree line, um, and they can den just about anywhere. And when I say den and not hibernate because these animals are not true hibernators. They go into what's called a state of torpor, basically deep sleep, where metabolism is lowered and their body temperature does drop a little bit, but it doesn't fluctuate like a true hibernator does going down to you know, near freezing or below freezing. Uh, so when they're in the den, um, that is when we don't have to worry about bears. And that's not as long of a period of time as people think. We're like, oh, we've got all these long winters and everything. For us, like we want winter to start end of October so we can go skiing and enjoy the snow and everything, the cold temperatures. Um, bears are potentially still very much out and active at that time. So to be safe, we would say by November, and it also depends on where you are. If you're in Southeast Alaska, for instance, it's milder there, the bear's den later. Um, here, it gets a little colder and up north even more so, the bears get into the den a bit earlier. But October, November, the bears go into to the den. Then we have the entire denning period. And I won't talk about their birth cycle and all that sort of stuff, which is absolutely fascinating. But um, what we're really concerned about are these two windows here. Mid to late April, uh, for when, when bears are out of the den, people have been seeing bears already um, up up above tree line, and I think some black bears have been seen um, you know near down here in the lowlands already. So they're out um, and they're hungry. They have not eaten anything since November. That is a long fasting period. Their physiology is 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 really remarkable to be able to do that. But they are hungry and lean when they come out of the den. And there's not much available for them. So particularly with black bears, this time of year, one thing we encourage people to do is pull their bird feeders, you know, by mid-April. Um, bird food is an attractant to bears. And uh, one that's denning, you know, we have, we're surrounded by forests, but everywhere you go, a bear in just a, you know, a short period of time could walk from its den site and be in your backyard and exploring your bird feeders. So um, come June and July, uh, we start to see a little overlap depending when the salmon come in. For our bears here, we're lucky they do have a chance to get salmon. Um, and so the bears then start focusing their energies towards the river drainages and the, the small creeks and tributaries where the salmon are spawning. And then it's through the summer and fall, midsummer to denning period is their hyperphagia um, stage. This is the most important time for these animals because it's the clock is ticking, winter is, is coming, um, and they need to get their fat um, content up to the highest level um, before they go into the den. And so that is a period of time when bears are wholly focused. Their entire day is spent on, on feeding. And when the food is good, when the berries are ripe and the fish are in and the salmon, are, everything's pretty honky-dory. But if some component of their uh, ecosystem starts to weaken a little bit, for instance, high water and hard to get fish or a bad berry crop, um, then bears get stressed out. And that is part of their behavior that can drive really serious conflicts around people um, because they normally go from docile and avoiding people to being a little more aggressive um, and stressed out because a food source is lacking um, what they need. So that's a period of time when we start to see most of the activity is July, August, September, 
when the bears are really on the hunt for their food. Um, but it's really more than half of the year they're out of the den and it's about half the year they're in the den. So six months of the year is when we have to behave ourselves and, and do the best we can. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier, if bears were blind and there are blind bears out there, they could survive um, because their nose tells them everything they need to know about what's going on. Um, their sense of smell is is unrivaled in the animal world. Uh, there isn't another mammal um, that had terrestrial mammal or otherwise that has the ability to smell um, small particles of food scent from potentially miles away. Uh, all, all bears have that ability. Polar bears, the highest, greatest sense of smell, but black bears and brown bears are, are a close second. Uh, just to give you a close uh, look at what a bear skull looks like, this is a little bit of a distorted image because it's a wide angle, but proportionately it's, it's accurate in terms of what the muzzle looks like. That open hole above the teeth there, that's the nasal cavity. Uh, those turbinate bones are their their bone structures and, and cartilaginous, and they hold the mucous membrane. And there's so many folds in there that increases the surface area. So for any small little scent particle to get picked up, the bears are gonna are gonna smell it. And to get a side on view, this is a black bear, um, but to get a side on bear, this is a, a brown bear skull. Um, this is the part of the nasal passage that has to deal with respiratory action here. It's not, it's not for smell. All the smell turbinates and everything are back here. And the olfactory bulb is right here. And this is the brain case here. The, the olfactory bulb is a significant portion of the animal's brain. And you can just generally speaking, if you, whatever part of the brain it is or something, if there's a large part of it, it must be important for the animal. Um, and this little membrane that's right here, there's bone here, of course, uh, but where the turbinate bones come in, this is all, it's, oops, diffuses back and it communicates directly with the olfactory lobe. And so that is a, a skull built to smell. Um, and, and that's, it does its job very, very well. So whether they're roaming on the tundra looking for food, whether it's maybe, you know, maybe a moose calf or a caribou calf or something like that in the spring, they can smell ripened berries. They can certainly smell other bears. Um, in the early spring, the smell of fresh shoots of grass and in this case, horsetail, like this little cub is, is mowing down the horsetail. Um, why it's important in the spring for them to be able to find food like this, um, and they do it quite well and they graze just like you would see a cow in a pasture. Um, those fresh shoots have the highest concentration of the proteins and sugars in them. Um, and as the, as the shoots grow, they get more fibrous and there's, they're less palatable and they they have less nutri nu nutrition per, you know, effort for the animal. So they try to get things early before they grow to um, uh, fibrous. Uh, or whether they're they're chasing salmon in a stream, um, bears are using that sense of smell and utilizing so many different habitats throughout the course of their summer. Um, they have mastered all of them, um, and they know where and when to find food in each one of these habitats and where when to not waste time. Like, I've walked through this for five years. I've never found a scrap of food in this stretch of the world. I'm just going to keep moseying right by, unless something catches their sniffer, like uh, a garbage can, for instance, in a nearby home. And it's that sense of smell that drives them to explore and exploit and look for food sources in people's backyards. And once they find something, even if it's just the lick of a, you know, half empty, you know, can or something, uh, it might not be much, but it was a reward. And that is then put into their map and they will come back to that place and look at other places that are similar. So any other house basically would look the same to a bear. And so they're very easily taught bad habits, quote unquote, bad habits um, by our 
inability or our ineffectual uh, management of our own garbage and waste. And so that's what we're trying to do is to get people to understand that for those six months, we really need to have our yards and our, our properties um, with no attractants for bears of any significance, at least. And then in the fall, going back to the tundra, looking for berries is um, another use of uh, food and a reliable food source for them on most years. So getting to the Susitna River Coalition and how this all ties in with them, and I'm very grateful that they offered us this platform, but the, um, the salmon, the Susitna River, the drainage is massive. It's an incredible ecosystem. Um, on the large scale, it's massive. And then every little creek, every little tributary, every little tundra pond, every kettle pond, all of those habitats combined making up the upper Susitna Valley here. Um, many of them are, are uh, salmon habitat. Much of that is salmon habitat. Not every single stream gets a salmon run, um, but most do. And uh, my wife and I are fortunate enough to, to live on one of those streams. This is a couple of pictures from our creek just below our house of coho salmon coming in the fall. And getting to that, um, we've lived here now for 18 years um, in this area and, and in this very spot um, for since 2006. And um, I guess that's 18 years if you do the math, new math. Um, and we are privileged to, to have call this our home and to share it with not just the bears, but everything else. The salmon stream right out our back door, the moose that come through the yard, you know, the birds, everything. We cherish all of that. Um, but there's a responsibility that comes and an awareness that, um, you know, over time, not everybody's perfect, but we learn these things. These are things that we can control and we can help mitigate the problem. And so this is our stream right here, Question Creek, and that's our house, very close to it. And just to give you another little sense of perspective, so there's our home and the creek is right here. It's, it's a little bit over 100 feet away. Um, and for 16 years, I can count on one hand the number of times we've had a bear near the house. They're in the creek every year foraging for salmon. And we have trails that go right to our back door. We've had one black bear in the driveway once that we know of, of course. And uh, some bears came up by our fire pit and we banged a couple pots and pans and they ran away. Um, speaking about the, the mitigation of this, in the summer months, starting you know just a couple weeks ago, we started putting our trash, our bear resistant uh, 55 gallon drum with a steel lid is, is about 100 feet away from the house as well in that location there. Um, and then pretty much everything else is, is kind of bear friendly. Um, and it's a very simple system and it works very well. And, uh, you know, knock on wood, our record um, holds up. Another look at it here, just so you get an idea, there's, there's where we keep our bear. There's the bear can right there. And this, of course, is in the wintertime. And then the creek is, is right here. So um, close proximity in basically a, a wildlife corridor in, in a bear corridor. And uh, we um, are very thankful that we haven't had any issues. And it's what, when these things show up uh, about the second week or so in September, we get very excited because we're thrilled to have, uh, as a fly fisherman, as a, I studied fisheries for a while, to have wild Pacific salmon right in our backyard, um, spawning and creating the next generation of life. Um, and with that comes bears. And um, many years I lived here, we lived here and we didn't see any bears, but every day I'd go down and walk along the creek and there'd be 10 or 12 carcasses right along the creek. So we know they were there every single night. It wasn't until I got a couple of game cameras and I thought, ah, maybe we can capture some of this action. So this is what a bear, this is, this is just a salmon with a little trout behind it trying to get a free meal. Um, This is coming around in there. We get a, about a thousand coho, maybe a little less, run up this stream every year. Um, 
And with that comes, comes bears. And just to give it, this is a bears. It's pitch. This is nine o'clock at night. So it's back. The red light wasn't on. The bear still would have been able to see that fish. Um, didn't get it, of course, but. Um, what we've experienced here is we've had um, sows with cubs every year. We had one male bear come to one. Um, and it's usually one bear and cubs for a month, every night. And uh, here, this little, uh, his, his meal there, I think mom probably caught that for him or her. <laughs> Um, it's the, it not every, it's not lucky every and this is last year this female I believe was probably her first litter of cubs um, she was not a great I have hundreds of 15 second videos of her not catching salmon oh. um, but she was giving it her best effort it was also the water was quite high even in this small stream it makes a difference and um, and there were fewer salmon but you, that's every, you know, they walk through the creek and they disturb something and they'll, they'll chase it. Yep. And here's her two yearlings that she had with her. Um, and they provide quite a bit of entertainment. We can watch these guys from our back deck. We have a pair of infrared binoculars that we can, night vision goggles that we can watch as well. They're learning. And just so we end on a happy note with that. So here's the same mom from last year. That was her strategy, which didn't usually work. But in this case, she gets lucky and um, trips up a fish. And she got it. And. Yay. If you listen, you can hear her. The cubs. You can just hear them. So, um, we're we're privileged to have that, and we we like to think that we're acting responsibly and we're doing the best we can. When the salmon come in, we call our neighbors when we first see the salmon, so that folks know. Okay, the salmon are in the stream. The bears follow about a week later. Um, and then we let people know when there's bears in the area and in our neighborhood, just so people can be you know, a little extra vigilant. Um, people come from all over the world to see bears. They're not easy to see. Um, here in the upper valley and, and other places, there's, there's a very few places where you can reliably see bears. Like here, this is Maureen, my lovely wife. We had a chance to go to Katmai several years ago. Um, and we were able to, you know, enjoy that. And that's an area where there's lots of bears. Um, it's a national park. Um, there's about 180 bears that use that annually. Um, and the park service has to work very diligent, di diligently uh, to uh, control the people and the bears um, and, and, the, and the waste. You may recognize this bear as same as this one that's grazer she won fat bear week this grazer. year finally i've been rooting for her for for five years and uh she is one of the the toughest most awesome mothers ever but this is the bears walking right through the camp right right along cabins they they own that place but it's because it's managed by the park service that that human proximity to so many bears um, goes off more or less without a hitch. Um, but it requires an awful lot of work uh, to, to do that. Yeah. Um, so where the fish are abundant, the bears are, are abundant too. We have a lot of fish up here, but they're more spread out. We don't have waterfalls. We don't have areas like at Brooks Falls where bears congregate, where people can watch them. But you have to know that all of these little tributaries you drive over uh, coming into town and up, this, up the highway and stuff like that, those all have bears on them during the summer months. So whether you're a fly fisherman or you're camping at some of those places, all of these things need to be taken into consideration. When all the feasting is done and all the, the salmon are gone and the bears go off into the woods, they do what bears do in the woods, they, they poop. 
Um, and just quickly looking at this map here, showing the current range of uh, all the bears in North America. These are all, this is the brown bears, and then black bears are the gray, and there's overlap in Alaska where both occur. And of course, polar bears. So you can see all of Alaska is bear country. And so it's something to always be considering, even if you're not near a salmon stream, um, that there's a potential for bear encounters. So bears feast all day long. They go into the woods to then bed down for the night, whatever. They poop in the woods, defecate, to use a more scientific term. Um, they are bringing massive loads of nitrogen, particularly um, that came from the Pacific Ocean and depositing it right in and around our trees and in our forests and on the riparian, on the banks and whatnot. It's the best fertilizer in the world. And it's been documented in many cases and in many ways that this nitrogen um, is coming from the ocean, from the bear, from the fish, to the bears, to the trees to produce a healthy forest ecosystem around our, our precious streams and eco and river systems here. So just a little example here of the carcass, even carcasses brought up, they decompose that nutrients go right into the ground and feeds those trees. So you might get a beautiful ecosystem that looks like this, all thanks to the salmon and the bears. Eagles get some fish and whatnot, um, and they do provide some nutrition, but nowhere on the scale that bears do. Oh, I guess that was, I thought I had one more slide. Shoot, I was gonna end with a little more of a, we'll just end with the fact that the bears play an important role in our ecosystem. They provide nutrition um, for the forest. They also are an important component to life in Alaska. Um, it's a wild place and we wanna keep our bears wild and be able to have um, safe interactions with bears on, on their terms. So I guess that's about it for me. I probably went a little longer than I should have. I did, darn it. No, that was great. Thank you so that much. Was. The overview, that was super fun. And Brian did end up getting on Zoom. I don't know if we want to. Yeah, can we can we hear you, Brian? He's muted. Oh, hey, if you are mute, yay! There you are. Hey, yeah. Brian. We did share a little bit in the beginning about you know kind of the roots and how how you got you helped get Bear Necessities going. But it'd be great from people to hear any more from you that you want to share. Well, thank you very much, Doug. That was fantastic. Or if Margaret has questions, even. Yep. And um, well, thanks, Brian. Yeah, that was very, very good. Yeah. Well, I'm sure I'm sure you've covered it already, but um, it was just a group of us that saw there were there was a better way to to deal with our our human available food, whether it be trash or dog food or bird seed or cooking oil, whatever it may be that um, something needed to be done in Talkeetna to bring awareness to everybody, residents and tourists and businesses alike. And, um, and in the beginning, we were able to, to, to get bear proof or bear resistant garbage cans in town and, and get some public awareness posters and rack cards to make people more aware of, of what the problem was and how they could contributed to making it a, a better, safer situation in town. It was um, the people that, Diane, my wife, um, Sandy Kogel, a longtime park ranger, um, George Wagner, another longtime park ranger. We all had a great respect for the bears, for just the magnificent animals they are here in the wild. And like Doug alluded to that, it's a big part of living in Alaska to know that we are surrounded by habitat that is still intact and can support such huge animals roaming around. And um, but we're just as vulnerable to losing that population of bears as that that map showed what the historic range had been. Um, it's it's being reduced all the time. We also had a great respect for bears and just how powerful and dangerous they can be. 
And when you get habituated bears in a neighborhood or in a town, that that makes a very, very dangerous situation. And <clears throat> we had some incidents 20 years ago where people were, were having close encounters in the streets and alleys of Talkeetna. And it was a recipe for disaster. And to, to prevent that, um, we, we, we needed to do something to get to get garbage contained and to make people aware of, of how they are an important part of of reducing attractants and and keeping bears passing through. They're gonna come through town, but if they don't find anything, they're gonna keep right on going. They're not gonna linger, they're not gonna come back looking for, for the, the same handout they got before. And that's that's the key is making food unavailable to the bears so they don't hang around our, our houses in our businesses, and they just keep doing what they've always done long before we were here, is forging in the forest and fishing in the streams and looking for that moose calf or that winter kill and, um, and just keep moving around. I've got real close to my house, two old bear dens that are, are just spectacular. They both are dug under under big birch trees, and one of them is sizable. It was no doubt a, a den that housed a, um, a sow with big cubs. <laughs> and um, it, it's pretty impressive. And I've backtracked bears in the spring to their dens. And it's uh, it's pretty exciting to know that, that we live real close to the bears. And they're here. You know, they want to avoid us. And they're stalking around looking for stuff and pass by our homes all the time. The dogs might bark and know about it, but um, we're probably most of the time totally unaware that they're, they're passing through. But thank you very much, Margaret, for, for inviting Bear Necessities to, to be on and appreciate it. Oh yeah, I'm so happy that y'all could make it on tonight. And I'm so glad that you ended up getting Zoom squared away. It's always such a, <laughs> technology is always fun <laughs> yes yeah i just wanted to add we have a facebook page up so join up if you want to share information and get information and reach and out facebook page called so we can and we can put a bear, link it's yeah. called bear necessities coalition yeah 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 thanks sorry to interrupt you there i just want to make sure that we got the name out no thank you that's great Appreciate it, Margaret. Yeah, really, really wonderful. And sorry, I I rambled on. I was I was working under the pretense that Brian wasn't here, and so I was trying to consume <laughs> time. But oh, it was so awesome! I got I'm, a little carried I'm away. So glad you kept going. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So in years past, or when you first started, um, it seems like you had gotten a bunch of resources or had had um, taken the initiative to kind of help find ways to bring resources to the community in the form of bear safe trash and things like that. Do you see a need for an expansion of that? Well, um, right now, as far as, as trash receptacles, I think there's enough, but they're not being utilized. Okay. You know, there, there's a number of them that are probably in, in, not in a prime location and others that that have been taped shut and not open for use. So I think the the main thing is is to get the ones that we have available to get them in the right location and get them all opened up and used. I think what um, would be very helpful is is probably some kind of system for for trash collection in downtown, whether it's the businesses pooling together and and you know putting money into it somehow to hire somebody to empty the trash. Um, the the public doesn't know that the trash cans aren't you know public trash cans. They're they're um, they think they're probably like any other place. They're, they're all they're all taken care of by the municipality. But we don't have a municipality here in Tokyo. We're unincorporated. The borough maintains its trash cans in the park, 
all the other trash cans are taken care of by by businesses and some of the businesses are burdened with um with dealing with more trash than they need to there it should be more equitable and spread all through the town and the trash is it doesn't really matter if a person sells a commodity that produces trash or not because if you buy a you know a soda you might not be in front of the business you bought it from when you've finished the soda and then you're going to look for a trash can and just to keep Talkeetna safe and to keep it looking as nice as possible there should be trash cans available and they should be maintained they shouldn't be overflowing the dumpsters shouldn't be overflowing um they we, we can do better we can do better for yeah for sure. brian like you yeah, said i would just add in in that that is a big issue downtown and then we also have to look at residential so there is probably a need for mm -hmm. help by newer residents who are coming in for bear resistant canisters or ways to make sure they contain their trash and their food and keep livestock safe so there's kind of a town piece and then there's the residential piece yeah and, and how does that message change or shift when there's a large seasonal population um that isn't necessarily dealing with us all the time or every year and are renting um which I feel like it, you know, you might not invest in a 55 gallon drum with a, with a top. And I, yeah. And, and so it's interesting to think about that population and how, which is significant and how to communicate that piece. I, I would advocate, advocate, um, you know, if you're running a rental property, if you are running a and b Airbnb, um, it's, it, it's your responsibility to buy a trash, a bear resistant trash receptacle. You're, you're making revenue off those seasonal workers that are coming in. It's not the seasonal worker's responsibility to go and spend $300 for a bear. But if you're charging $1,000 a month in rent for a place, if, you know, $300 investment that will last forever, if there's steel, it's, it's, you know, as long as it's maintained well. And um, it's, it's a responsibility that we need to advocate for people to take that responsibility on and brian was saying earlier this morning you know it's one thing if if maureen and i have a, a you know tight neat tidy home you know location but if our neighbors don't i could just as easily walk into my backyard and have a an angry bear come charging down our driveway or trail that's coming from somebody else's house that it was getting into garbage at so it's it's also it's it's more of a community thing. When you make that investment, you're also like putting a shield of safety around people around you. And same with the businesses downtown, um, working out some sort of system for those bins to get the dumps open. You know, I don't know, is it closed one day a week or two in the summer? Maybe one, I think. Anyways, it's open more days than it's than it's not. And so getting paying somebody to collect those trash cans that are bears that we have downtown right now every other day or every day even and bring that to the dump um we'll keep those they keep talkina looking neater people won't be having to put garbage on top of the garbage cans you know um where it, then it becomes a risk so um but it, i think getting that word out there um and having people feel that need for that that bit small investment for a huge long-term return. And like, like I said, it's it's a problem that we have answers to that um, are, are easy answers. We're not asking for an arm and a leg from people to do this, it, but it's, again, it's it takes some time to get that message out there. And I think to, to get people vested in it. Um, some people won't, will just resist. I'm not spending any money on that. That's ridiculous. I've been putting my garbage in this box for, 20 years, I've never had a problem. So there's that mindset too, that, you know, you have to sort of pick your battles, but um, yeah, it's, it's a responsibility. If you're charging rent, if you're renting a place, there should be a bear uh, resistant food receptacle or trash receptacle there for, for you to deal with. Um, and so we want to be there, like Doug says, we want to be there to open the conversation, educate and help each other, you know? 
with how can we do this better and how can we keep getting better and how can we learn, you know, um, and, and just do better for each other. And how can we help with funds, bare necessities? We're looking at grants and we're looking at other opportunities and how can we help with funding and with getting these bare barrels out in a affordable manner, a more affordable manner, so we can help each other do this because we all can get better. I mean, I will admit we had our freezer out on a back deck in the back of our shop for, for years, you know, and we had to kind of we were fortunate we never had it broken into, but we kind of had to educate ourselves a few years back and go, okay, you know, and we had our kind neighbors who said, you know that you maybe need to do something a little better than this, you know, and in a respectful manner. And so I, and I am very bear cognizant and have lived with bears, you know, out at our homestead and been um, very aware of my food. But I think there's just new things we keep learning and we've got to help each other um, and kind of elbow each other as a community. Let's do better. <laughs> yeah. I think it's very easy sometimes to think, Oh, I'm in town, you know, there are no bears here or it's not a problem where I've done this for so long. It's not a problem, but it only takes one time. Um, yeah. 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 There was that 20 year gap or so from the 2001, you know, uptick in bear, encounters thing to to let to last summer and and i think in that middle period there was you know even from people who lived here for a long time they were you know placated it was a bit of like oh yeah it's like you know sort of out of sight out of mind kind of thing and and so last summer it was very much in sight and in mind and um it it just became aware i was you know the the organization i if i'm correct never really went away they were still producing record they were still putting information out there but uh I think maybe developing a more regular annual seasonal messaging type of thing and communication with business owners and all that kind of stuff just to keep it, you know, in the forefront. And then if it goes away forever, it'll be great. Yeah. Yeah. I worked in Yakutat briefly and they had this amazing jingle on the radio that was almost every other ad was this incredible bear safety jingle. And I, you know, it's still embedded in my brain and I still I love it. Yeah. Oh, we need that. We need a jingle. <laughs> we need a jingle. All right, Doug, get that guitar down off the wall back there. Let's yes. do it. <laughs> cool. Well, I'm really grateful for the work that you all are doing and thank you so much for being here. Um, it's great yeah it was kind of shocking last fall and the end of last summer to hear about all the encounters that people were having whether that was because of high water or lack of food or any other you know reason yeah. that was out there but just kind of highlights the importance of remaining cognizant and safe throughout the summer season so thank you um besides your facebook page how else can folks get in touch with you and where can they get rap cards and information from you they can reach out to me or Brian. Um, I've got a big supply and Brian has some too. And I'm definitely happy to share, share those. So yes. Great. So folks can check out the Bear Necessities Coalition Facebook page and probably get in touch with you through there. And if not, feel free to reach out to SRC and we can put you in touch with the Bear Necessities Coalition. Thank um, you. And if there's anything else that we can help spread information about, please let us know. It's a great, great okay. presentation. And, and I'll, I'll just add, if if anybody that's listening in or on this Zoom knows of, um, you know, some bear resistant trash receptacles that are available, you know, pass it along. There's um, all sorts of outfits that are, are making things and new new items come online and whatnot. But uh it's something that's that's needed not only in Talkeetna, it could be useful for every town in Alaska. Um, it's it continues to be a, a big stumbling block having the right type of residential bear resistant trash can. Great, thank you. Yeah. yeah, that's it. We'll put the word out there. Well, thank you all for being here. If there's thank is there anything you. you'd like to add before we kind of close out. No, just thank you so much to Susitna River uh, Coalition. We, um, it's a it's a good it's a good fit this topic with that. I think it was really wonderful to and perfect time of year to do it. So thanks for including 
us and your guys' bigger picture. Yeah, yes. super glad y'all could be here. Um, so thanks everyone for being for you guys for being here this evening on a beautiful spring night. It's always a little <laughs> hard when the sun is shining. <laughs> um, and just so everybody knows, um, MEA elections are going to be closing out here. Um, on the 29th is the last day to vote online. Um, the Sioux Sitna River Coalition has endorsed Henrik Wessel for the Sioux Sitna West District and Daniel Balden for the Sioux Sitna East District. Um, if you have any questions about how to vote, we have some how-tos on our Facebook and and our website. Um, but you could also reach out to our energy coordinator, June Okada, who um, has a lot of great information um, and her email is on our website. Additionally, we are going to be at the Kenai um, Sports and Rec Show, and I'm just double checking those dates. I believe it's May 4th through 6th or 3rd through 5th. You can check our website for that. Um, and then we have just selected the date for our um, second annual Plants for Salmon Riparian Planting Day on Montana Creek, and that will be June 15th. So that's a fun one. Um, <laughs> darn, um, <laughs> a really fun event. It's the second year. Uh, there's good food, um, lots of fun, lots of planting outside along Montana Creek. Um, and this is our last winter speaker event for the series. So we are for the season. And so hope to see everyone next year with another great lineup. So thank you all so much and have a good night. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, Margaret. Okay. Good night. Good night.